Uh, Luke Waddy, who is in the Philippines, Luke and Rachel send their greetings in a happy 2024. They're, ti- they're on a little different time schedule over there than we are. In the, so he wishes all of you, and sent me a text saying uh, to wish all of you a happy new year. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to be taking a look at 1 Peter this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, specifically. So we talk about the new year and things that you can do to help have a better new year, or at least a good new year. Maybe you had a a really good one last year and you're thinking it can't get much better than this past year. Um, Well, this maybe will help you to maintain a good new year this year, this 2024. To some extent, having a good year is somewhat a matter of perspective, isn't it? You know, we we look at our situation, we look at our condition, we look at uh, things that are happening around us, and sometimes we can bemoan what's happening, and then we see somebody who's in a worse condition or going through worse circumstances, and then we think, we realize, you know, I I need to be praising God for what's going on in my life. Um, We went, my son's been thinking of moving back to Florida, and uh, so we went looking at houses the other day, and we went through some of these newer, really, really nice subdivisions with homes that I can't afford. <laughs> and we're looking at, and you know, before we looked at those homes, I thought I had a pretty nice home. <laughs> and you see some of these, and you go, wow, that's how people live on the other side of the tracks. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but so it, it, perspective, right? And uh, we, we sometimes forget that most of us, I think, just simply as Americans enjoy a a very high standard of living compared to people in the rest of the world, or to many of the people in the rest of the world. And and I feel uh, blessed in many different ways, many different ways. I hope you do too. But today I'd like to just start off by reviewing some of the events of this past year, some of the major events, events that you and I had little to do with. Uh, We had really no control for the most part. I don't think any of us did over most of these events. In January, in fact, on January 23rd, Microsoft invested $10 billion in open AI. Uh, that's, that's the up and coming thing. My son's been talking about AI. He works with generative AI, and I can't tell you the difference between AI and generative AI. I know he, he can, but um, you know, that's, that's what's coming up on the horizon. And there are a lot of concerns with that as well. It could benefit companies. In fact, he's working with some rental car companies that are looking at using AI to do different things with their rental car companies. Uh, So there's some, just like any technology, there are some things that it can do that are good. And then there are some very serious concerns about AI. And uh, if you'd like to see a little glimpse of that, you can watch the movie on Netflix called How It All Ends. How, how many of you have seen that movie? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, where AI is used for nefarious purposes. And uh, anyways, but so Microsoft's investing a huge amount of money in opening $10 billion. On February 4th, the Chinese spy balloons, remember them? Uh, Chinese spy balloon uh, drifts over America. February 21st, Russia uh, suspends their participation in the nuclear arms reduction treaty causing a lot of people concern. Will Russia launch a nuclear missile attack? Will they continue to build up their arsenal? Uh, In March, Silicon Valley bank collapse causing a lot of us to wonder, uh, should I move my money into a different bank, right? You're wondering if if you have a small hometown bank, should I put it into a a bigger bank that maybe has uh, more uh, reserves? Uh, that can uh, survive more difficult times. In April, Finland was named the 31st member of NATO. Now, how many of you had a vote in that? (laughs) None of us, right? These are all things pretty much beyond our control. I have a reason for saying that when we get to the end of this list. April 4th, uh, again, Finland was named the 31st member of NATO, which uh, means that the uh, border, uh, the NATO nations that border Russia uh, was increased greatly as Finland joined. Uh, Germany, on April 15th, closed uh, their nuclear power plants, ending 50 years of nuclear power. On May 5th, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, declared an end to the COVID-19 uh, hoax. Oh, I'm a global emergency. That's all. Sorry. Um, 
slip of the tongue there. <laughs> so uh, obviously COVID was real and I know there are some families that suffered uh, from COVID, but I think, well, you know what I think. May 6th, the coronation of King Charles III. June 18th, the Titan submarine goes missing while exploring the Titanic site. On June 23rd, the Wagner Group, the, the, it's a sort of a mercenary band of individuals, uh, started marching toward Moscow and was going to attack Moscow. Of course, that never happened. I, I wondered if it was ever going to happen in the first place, but it was in the news and all of us were watching to see what was going on. My understanding is, I don't know if they're still there, they actually ended up in Belarus. And um, what they're doing there, I don't know. But anyways, August, August 8th of this past year, well, it's still this year, isn't it? It's still this, yeah, till tonight at midnight. So <laughs> August 8th of this year, Hawaii had the wildfires that burned 17,000 acres and killed 100 people. October 7th, and this is still ongoing, Hamas attacked Israel and uh, killed more people in one day uh, than has happened since World War II. In November, Xi Jinping came to meet President Biden, which was his first visit to the U.S. since 2017. And then in this month of December, uh, shipping firms suspended uh, Red Sea activity after Houthi militants launch, launched missiles attacking those cargo ships. Most of these things were beyond any of our control whatsoever. And, and so we look at these things and we're concerned about these things and we ask, how will, they, how will these things affect us as individuals, but we really can't change those things. Most of us have no power to have any influence in any of these things that I just named. But there are things in our life that come into our life that we do have power to change, things that we do have control over. And while we become very concerned about those things that we don't have concern, that we have no control over, right? We turn on the news and we watch it and maybe night after night, some of you have been following the situation in Israel and we're looking at that. And while uh, it may not seem to be affecting us directly. We all know that it's in affecting us somewhat indirectly, right? And may affect us even more directly in the future, depending on America's involvement. Of course, there's finances and things of that nature, um, a whole lot of things. But most of those, again, are beyond our control. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is uh, controlling those things we can control. And we'll look at that in a minute. But uh, we were talking in the beginning about having a... Um, a different perspective on things. And here's a man that really did indeed have a bad day. Maybe you've seen this before. It was in a Florida newspaper a while ago. Supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly a true story. There was a man working on his motorcycle. I already like the guy. Um, <laughs> working on his motorcycle on his patio. And his wife was in the house in the kitchen. The man was racing the engine on the motorcycle and somehow the motorcycle slipped into gear. The man still holding the handlebars was dragged through a glass patio door and along with the motorcycle dumped onto the floor inside the house. Now at least you think that's far-fetched. As a 14-year-old, I had a Harley Davidson 250 Sprint, single cylinder. They don't make them anymore. It's probably be worth a whole lot more money now than it was then. And it had a little chain in the throttle thing that controlled the gas cable. And if dirt got in there, that chain would stick. And one day we had company, and I had the muffler cut in half, right? It was cut off to make a nice deep sound. And uh, I pull into the garage of the house we lived in at that time, and I knew we had company, so I thought, I'm going to rev it up and let them hear, you know, I'm riding my Harley with 250 you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I pull into the garage, and vroom, vroom, vroom. all of a sudden the chain catch, it sticks wide open. Well, the key switch wasn't up here where they are today. It's down here, and it's on the clutch side under my leg. So I got two choices, let it blow up, right, or try to, try to turn that key off before the motorcycle launches too far because I've got to let go of the clutch to do it. You can't, you can't get to it this way. So I dumped, it was still in gear, and I let go of the clutch. I couldn't get it in the neutral. I, I, I let go of the clutch, and I go to reach down, but the thing just took off. Ran into the refrigerator that we had out, <laughs> out in the garage. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> Needless to say, my dad wasn't happy. Uh, so so while, while this may sound far-fetched, I think it could happen, okay? <laughs> so the man still holding onto the handlebars was dragged through a glass patio door and along with the motorcycle dumped onto the floor inside the house. The wife, hearing the crash, ran into the dining room and found her husband laying on the floor, cut and bleeding. 
The motorcycle laying next to him and the patio door shattered. The wife ran to the phone and called an ambulance. Because they lived on a fairly large hill, the wife went down the several flights of long steps to the street to direct the paramedics to her husband. After the ambulance arrived and transported the husband to the hospital, the wife uprighted the motorcycle and pushed it outside. Seeing that gas had spilled all over the floor, the wife obtained some paper towels and blotted up the gasoline, but didn't, didn't know what to do with the paper towels, so she threw them in the toilet. The husband was treated at the hospital, released, and came home the same day. After arriving home, he looked at the shattered patio door and the damage done to his motorcycle, became severely depressed, thought the world was about to end. <laughs> motorcycle riders will understand that. Um, anyways, became despondent, went into the bathroom, sat on the toilet, and smoked a cigarette. <laughs> After finishing the cigarette, he flipped it between his legs into the toilet bowl where there were still some gasoline. The wife, who was in the kitchen, heard a loud explosion and her husband screaming. She ran into the bathroom and found her husband lying on the floor. His trousers had been blown away and he was suffering burns on the buttocks, the backs of his legs and his groin. The wife again ran to the phone, called for an ambulance. The same ambulance crew came uh, and met them at the, uh, the... The same ambulance crew was dispatched and the wife met them at the street. The paramedics loaded the husband on the stretcher and began carrying him down to the street. While they were going down the stairs to the street, accompanied by the wife, one of the paramedics asked the wife how the husband had burned himself. She told them. The paramedics started laughing, laughing so hard that one of them tipped the stretcher and dumped the husband out. He fell down the remaining steps and broke his arm. Have you ever had a day like that? So when you think your day is going bad, just remember this story, right? <laughs> the person in this story had a really bad day, but again, he didn't have a lot of control, although he had some control over some factors, right? And his wife had some control over some factors. And the same is true with most things in life. We have some control over some factors and little control over other factors. Some of the uh, different factors that come into our life that affect our life to one degree or other fall into, I think, three categories. First of all, the decisions of God. And by that, I mean uh, God's sovereign plan for us. God has a plan for us. And no matter what you do or I do, we will not interfere with that plan. His sovereign plan will be carried out one way or the other. And so there are the decisions of God. You and I really can't change that. There are the decisions of others. Again, we may not be able to change those decisions, but we may be able to change our response to those decisions that others make. And then there are the decisions that we make. These are the decisions that we have the most control over. These are the factors in our life that we can control. Uh, things like doing what is right versus what is wrong. Telling the truth rather than lying. Not mouthing off, especially to the wrong person, right? and suffering the consequences of that. Not to steal, uh, not to be slothful, uh, to be loving and to kind. These are all things that we can make daily decisions regarding and, and will have an effect on our lives and how our lives go. In fact, that's what Peter talks about, I believe, here in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 8 through 18 this morning. I'm going to read them out loud and ask you to follow along with me silently. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see... Good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 
But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your word. And as we uh, rapidly now approach the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024, I pray, Lord, that we would incorporate your teachings into our life that no matter what happens beyond our control, we would do those things within our control in a way that would please you, that we would respond as you would have us to respond and not as our old nature and sinful self would like to respond. And to realize that in the process, as we do this, it not only pleases you, but most of the time makes life better. So Father, help us to learn from this passage this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Again, it says in this text, whoever would love life and see good days. I think most of us would say that we would like that, right? That we would like to see good days. Most uh, people want good days. They don't want bad days. And God's word is sort of like a GPS to help us to get there, to help us to have a good life. God hasn't instituted rules and laws and decrees made to make life miserable. Generally, when we follow God and his teachings, life goes better. Now, I understand, not always. Sometimes we suffer for doing what is right, and Peter recognizes that and addresses that here in verses 13 through 17. But even then, he says it's still better to suffer for doing what is right and what is good than for doing evil. Because in the end, ultimately, God will reward those who do what is right and good. Those, anyways, that are uh, you know, in his family, that know the Lord as their Savior, that are going to heaven. Uh, they will be rewarded whether they suffer or not here on earth uh, for um, doing what is right and doing what is good. And then, so he goes on and he gives us some very practical suggestions here in uh, these verses that will help us uh, to have that kind of good days, that kind of good life, uh, to have a better, if you will, 2024, or at least as good a 2024 if you had a really good 2023. The first principle that I think is stated in this passage is found in two verses. And really, if, you, if you're looking back for just a moment at um, verses 10 through 12, that's a quotation taken from Psalm 34. Uh, those pers uh, Peter refers back to an Old Testament passage to support the teachings of our Lord and what he is relaying to us here in this epistle that he's writing. Uh, so there's a little bit of redundancy because he'll say something and then the quotation from Psalm sort of verifies uh, what he says. And so in verses 8 and 11, uh, we see, I think, the principle that teaches us to seek to live in harmony with each other. Now, I believe that this is primarily addressed to believers as Peter is speaking to believers, but at the same time, the principles would apply to everybody, right? To believers and unbelievers alike. If you want to have a good life, seek to live in harmony. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that everybody believes. It doesn't mean that you have to compromise your morals or your values, but that you seek to live peacefully with people and to love people. In fact, actually, I think if you look at verse 8 when he says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another, I think these character qualities that he lists after that really help us to live in harmony with each other. In other words, if I am sympathetic, that helps me to get along with others, right? Somebody comes up to you and say, says, hey, they just discovered I have cancer. Oh, big deal. Quit being a whiner and, and, and you know, Pick up your, well, whatever, you know, get going. Now, that doesn't go well with people, does it? That's not a, that's not a way to live in harmony with it. Or if, if something else happens, you can understand how being sympathetic would be helpful to living in harmony. Love is brothers. If we love each other as we do our brothers, which involves, you know, forgiving and overlooking, the Bible talks about uh, that love overlooks a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that there's no effect to those sins, but that we're willing to forgive. 
We're willing to forgive. We're willing to forgive. You remember when the disciples asked Jesus, how often should I forgive my brother? What did he say? Do you remember? 70 times 7, right? And he wasn't just saying, hey, 49, uh, 490 times. He was saying, keep on forgiving. Keep on forgiving. And so as we do that with our family, right? We do that with our, with our brothers. You and, you and I, uh, maybe, at least I think I, our family does. Maybe you live in, a, in a, a family where you don't get along with your siblings. And I know that happens sometimes. But forgiveness certainly helps us to get along with family members. And so if we're sympathetic, if we love his brothers, that helps us to live in harmony. If we're in harmony, if we're compassionate, with people, it helps us to live in harmony with them. If we're humble, you know, if you're arrogant and prideful, that comes across very quickly. And people don't like that. People don't like arrogant and prideful individuals. And so really, I think the last half of verse 8 is, is a description of how to live in harmony. It's sort of defining how to do what the first half of verse 8 says. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. How do you do that? By being sympathetic, by loving his brothers, by being compassionate, and by being humble. Then the quote from Psalms, when he quotes from Psalm 34 in verse 11, the second half of the verse, he says, in order to have that good life and see good days, he must seek peace and pursue it. And again, that sort of goes along with the whole idea of harmony, right? Living in harmony with each other means basically living in peace with each other. Doesn't mean we agree on everything. Doesn't mean we have to compromise our morals and our values. It means we try to get along despite the differences that we may have. And in the process, that will help contribute to having a good life. The second thing, the second thing that I see in this passage that will help us to have a good life and to enjoy long days is to seek to live righteously. Again, if you look at verse 9, verse 9 says, do not repay evil with evil. And that's supported again from Psalm 34 in verse 11a when he says he must turn from evil and do good. It is our sinful inclination to get even, to seek revenge. Sometimes we don't even think about it, right? Somebody cuts you off and you, you do something you shouldn't do. Right? You think a bad thought, you say something you shouldn't say, some people give you hand gestures, um, and they don't even think of it. And maybe you even rode with Christians, right? Christian people that have shocked you. I, I remember being, being with a, a pastor one time that got angry and he cussed, and I was just sort of, I was sort of shocked that this particular pastor let out this profanity when he got mad. It shouldn't be. That's the sinful nature, right? We all, we all are, have that sinful nature, and I probably shouldn't have been as shocked as I would was, but I, I was shocked. By it. And, and he let it out because that person did something that was displeasing to him, and it was sort of, sort of his way of getting back at the person. So you, you cuss at him, right? Ever have anybody cuss at you? Yeah, most of us probably have at one time or another. Um, and, and so th- that, doesn't, that doesn't usually go well, does it? <laughs> in fact, that's usually how fights escalate. Remember when you were in school, somebody said something to you that you didn't like, you said something back, and it just sort of escalated, and before long you were exchanging punches, and sometimes over stupid things. Jimmy probably knows a guy that I, knew, I went to school with, Michael um, Giannakopoulos, I think his last name was. I'm saying, if I'm trying to, anyways, he had this little Honda 90 or something like this, and he was sitting around, actually standing in the hallway of school and bragging about how his his uh, little Honda 90 would do like 70 miles an hour. And I said, yeah, in your wildest dreams, or something like that, some sort of smart aleck comment. And he, looked, and he said something, and I said something, and before long, we were punching each other in the hallway of the high school over whether or not, and you know what the bottom line is? Oh, I remember what I said. Yeah, down a real big hill. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> How stupid is that, right? We're, we're punching each other over whether or not his Honda 90 would go 70 miles an hour, because we all know it wouldn't, so <laughs> why fight over it? No. You know what I'm saying? So when we repay evil for evil, that doesn't usually solve the problem. When we seek to get even, it simply usually escalates the trouble that we will have in our lives. John Piper notes this. He says, there are two main reasons why Christians should act this way. That is uh, to turn from evil and do good. 
He says one is that it reveals something of the way of God or something of the way God is. God is merciful. He makes a sunrise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. So we are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And then the second reason he says that we ought to turn from evil and do good is that the hearts of Christians are satisfied with God and are not driven by the craving for revenge or self-exaltation or money or earthly security. God has become our all-satisfying treasure, treasure. And so we don't treat our adversaries out of our own sense of need and insecurity, but out of our own fullness with the satisfying glory of God. You joyfully Peter says, accepted the plundering of your property uh, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. What takes away the compulsion of revenge is our deep confidence that this world is not our home and that God is our utterly sure and all-satisfying reward. And I, I, think, I think he nails it with those two things. But I think there's a third, a third reason why not to repay evil with evil. And that's what I mentioned earlier, is that it usually makes the situation worse, not better. Let me give you an example from Scripture. In Judges chapter 15, Samson had been wronged by his father-in-law. Do you remember the story? Right, so he had married this Philistine girl, and he, he goes away, and he's away for quite a while, and the father-in-law gives the wife of Samson to another man, to one of Samson's friends. And Samson comes back, and he wants to see his wife, and the father-in-law, oh, guess what? I gave her away to someone else. And, and so Samson says, now I really got a, a reason to get even with the Philistines. And so in return, Samson burns down their wheat harvest. Well, the Philistines said, you know what? We did wrong. We, you know, we should have never done that. Samson was right. Let's just say bygones be bygones. It's even, you know, everything's okay, right? Is that how the story ends? <laughs> no, what happens? The Philistines, out of retaliation of, or revenge to get even with Samson for burning down their, their wheat fields, they go and burn his wife to death and her father. And they kill him. And then Samson comes back and kills some more. And basically what you have is th this guy getting even with this guy, and then they want to get even with that. And, and it's just back and forth, back and forth, and it escalates and gets worse and worse until he kills, what, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. That's usually the way it goes when we seek revenge. Not that it gets to that extent, but it doesn't get better, it gets worse. Somebody does something to you, you do something back. They do something later on to get even with you. You do something later on to get even with them. And it doesn't help. It usually doesn't help. Now, another example from practical life. A, a wife finds out that her husband's been cheating on her, and so she goes out and cheats on him and gets even with him. There, now you know how I felt. And does that make the marriage better normally? No. No. It usually ends in divorce when that type of thing happens. Or a, a husband finds out that his wife has been cheating on him, and rather than going out and cheating on her, he shoots the boyfriend, thinking that he eliminates the problem. And you've all read these stories in the news. Actually, I know of a person that actually did that and is still serving time in jail right here in Pasco County. Found out his wife was cheating on him and, and went to the place where he knew that his wife was going with this one, sat on the sidewalk waiting for them to come. They pull up, he gets up, he walks over to the car, shoots the guy in the head. And now he's spending the rest of his life in prison. Did it make things better? No, it just escalated the problems in his life. Now he has to deal with living in prison for the rest of his life. Most sins have dangerous and deadly consequences, and revenge is surely, surely one of those. The Bible says revenge belongs to who? God. We don't need to seek to get even. We may want to. <laughs> That old nature will rise it up inside of us and say, yeah, do this, you know. And maybe you can get away with it. Do it secretly. Do it privately. Do it in the, at the night, you know. Don't let anybody know about it. Don't talk to your friend. No, just don't do it. Do not be overcome by evil, Romans 12, 21 says, but instead overcome evil with good. And so we seek to live in harmony with others, and it helps our life to go better. We seek to live righteously, and it helps our life to go better. And there's a third principle here that Peter talks about in this passage as well, and it's seek to speak righteously. 
Again, in verse 9 and verse 10. Verse 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but instead with blessing. The opposite of what you may want to do. Instead of cursing them back, and I would suggest don't bless them with the whole idea that you're, <laughs> you're hoping to get a response out of them, right? They say something bad to you and you go, oh, well, bless you. Bless your soul, you know. <laughs> Verse 10, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Over and over and over again, the Proverbs talk about the, the way that we talk to others and how that can make our life go better or how it can make the life of others go better. What you say to people can not only influence your life, but can influence their life. It can cause a violent reaction in some cases, or it can cause peace to come about as the result of what we say. And so in Proverbs twelve eighteen, it says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs twelve twenty five: An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word, cheers him up. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.23, a man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. Proverbs 16.21, the wise in heart are called discerning, and pleasant words promote instruction. Proverbs 17.27, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint, and a man of understanding is even tempered. Over and over again, we find teachings in the Word of God. The book of James is another good place to find where we are told to control the tongue, even though it's uncontrollable to some extent. And, and so what we say to individuals can either make their day go better as well as ours or make it go worse. And so we're to not pay, repay evil with evil or insult with insult. And so that's in the context of doing wrong but instead with blessing. In other words, turn from evil and do good. Sort of the same principle, but having to do this time with speech, not necessarily actions. And then what are the results of that? So if I seek to live in harmony with others, if I seek to live righteously, if I seek to speak righteously, what's the results of that according to this text? Well, if you look at verses 9 through 12, we find the results. First of all, the divine results. The divine results, because I believe there are divine... I guess I wasn't... I went the wrong way here, excuse me. There's divine results and then there's practical results. The divine results are God's favor is toward those who live righteously. Look at verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult, or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you, so that you may inherit a blessing. And so when you bless others who insult you, somehow, in some way, that's going to result in you receiving a blessing. Maybe it's speaking of the blessing of doing what's right. Now, sometimes when we do what's right, that in and of itself is a blessing to us. Well, I know maybe I could have profited by lying or by cheating, but I did what was right. And there's a satisfaction of the soul in the believer. And I'm not talking about an arrogance that I did right. But just the satisfaction of the soul in knowing that I did what was right. And maybe that's the blessing that Peter's talking about. Or maybe it's a future blessing that we alluded to earlier. That someday when we get to heaven, and certainly I think it involves that, that when we get to heaven, we will be blessed for doing what is right. And that is a part of the divine results. Verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so what we see is that God's favor is toward those who live righteously, who do what this passage talks about, who seek to live in harmony, who seek to live righteously, who seek to speak righteously. God hears their prayers. You might say, well, doesn't God hear everyone's prayers? Yeah, well, he hears them, but the idea of hear means responding to them. God does not respond. He's all-knowing, so obviously he knows what everybody is praying. But he doesn't respond to the prayers of the unrighteous. When we, when we live sinfully, it hinders our prayer life. In fact, the way you treat your wife, according to the New Testament te teachings of Peter, the way you treat your wife affects your prayer life and how God responds to your prayers. If you treat her harshly or cruelly or in an improper manner, God isn't going to answer your prayers. 
And so even though he's gracious, and sometimes, sometimes, and you know, I, I don't know, God has a, a plan and a purpose that's beyond my knowledge. Sometimes he does seem to respond to those. But generally speaking, don't expect to have a good prayer life if you're living an unrighteous life. Then there's the practical results. So the divine results are that God's favor is toward those who live righteously. But there are also the practical results. And I believe Peter's sort of getting at that in verse 13. Verse 13, where he says, who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Uh, uh, Giannikopoulos probably wouldn't have punched me in the face if I would have said, wow, you got a really fast Honda 90 then. You've got one of the ones made on Wednesday. <laughs> Instead of, yeah, down a big hill, right? I, I, brought, I brought the... the uh, the, I was going to say punishment, but I, I, I heightened the conflict by what I said rather than bringing peace to the conflict. And the bottom line is if I would have complimented him in some way, and even, even if uh, it was a minor compliment, he's probably not going to punch me for doing that. And, and the same is true in so many different areas of our life. When we, when we seek to live in harmony with people, they usually don't get mad at us. When we seek to live righteously and not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with good, people don't usually want to hurt us. In fact, wow, this guy, he's a pretty good neighbor, right? And when we seek to tell the truth and, and not speak evil to others, people don't want to harm us. That's what Peter's saying. Verse 13, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? In most cases, most situations, they're going to like you better. It's not going to bring harm to you. It's going to bring goodness to you. The good days that he was talking about even in the beginning of this passage. But occasionally, and Peter recognizes this, occasionally there are those who do what is right, especially in relationship to serving God, and it does bring something bad into their lives. Maybe persecution or suffering. And so verse 14 says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened. But in your heart, so always set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. In other words, as people see you enduring unjust treatment for doing good, you do good, but you experience some sort of unjust retaliation, that's going to create a curiosity in some people where they may ask you then, so you know, why do you take that? Why don't you get even with that bum? You know, or whatever else. And, and that gives you the opportunity that opens the door for you to say, well, here's why. Because Christ has made a difference in my life. And, and it gives you the opportunity uh, to give an answer to everyone, as it says here, that ask a reason of the hope that you have. But again, it says, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Did you know that one of the accusations against the early church was that they were an immoral group because they had these love feasts and, and they would meet together, they would share food and rumors started. Uh, other things were going on at these. The love feasts were part of their communion. We have separated communion from the love feast, but in the early church, what we're told in history is that they had these love feasts that and, and communion was a part of that. But the unsaved people around them started thinking there was more going on than just that. Why was that? Because they lived in a very immoral world where they were doing wrong things all the time. That's, in Romans chapter 1, you read about the sexual immor immorality that was rampant in ancient Rome. It's not a new phenomenon. Immorality has been around since the beginning of times. In fact, it may not be as bad now as it was then. We look at the world around us and say, man, oh man, you know, people aren't getting married anymore. They're shacking up with this person and that person and they're doing whatever they want and we think it's so bad. It was like that in ancient Rome. Maybe worse in some ways. And, and so they had, I think in part, they were inferring upon the believers their, their suspicions because of their own immorality. But that, that's what happened. And some of them were accusing the believers of uh, participating in immoral activities when in reality uh, they weren't. And so they were being spoken even of for doing what was right and doing what was good. And sometimes it's worse than that, right? Sometimes in some countries people try to share Christ with others and they end up in jail. You know, they end up being punished for their good behavior. Verse 17, Peter tries to encourage those who are suffering that kind of experience. He says it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
In other words, no matter what happens to you, no matter what the results are, the divine or practical, no matter what the results are, it's always better to, if, even if you have to suffer for doing good than doing evil. And then he gives the example of Christ, who was the only perfectly good individual who never did anything wrong, yet suffered cruel and unjust treatment. Verse 18, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So do you want to have a good 2024? Well, some very practical ways to do that are to seek to live in harmony with each other to seek to live righteously in this world and to seek to speak rightly as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there's so much more that influences our lives and can make it good or bad. But certainly these things are foundational to avoiding many of the problems of life that we cause for ourselves by retaliation with words or with actions that are really evil, that are just a, a desire to get even or uh, to exercise some sort of vengeance on the individual. Father, I, I pray that you would help us to always seek to live in harmony with each other, especially believers, but all of our neighbors, everyone around us, that you would help us to seek to speak the truth in all situations and to speak kind words, Uplifting words, encouraging words, that's hard to do. The, the tongue is, a, is a, a deadly fire. But through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can do better and help us to live righteously. Father, help us to put into practice the things that we've briefly talked about this morning as we find them here in 1 Peter chapter 3. And I pray your blessings on every, everybody here this new year as we seek to serve you, as we seek to be a witness to you, no matter what happens in the world around us. Those things beyond our control help us to respond in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to say God bless you. I thank you for being here this morning and Happy New Year. Greet someone with that as you leave today. If you'd like prayer, one of our elders is up front that would love to pray with you.